Welcome back guys and today we're doing part two of the ultimate showdown between the 7700K clocked at 5 gigahertz versus the Ryzen 7 1700 clocked at 4 gigahertz versus the dual Xeons clocked at 3 gigahertz. So there's 16 cores, 32 threads of that Sandy Bridge architecture and how will it fare at 4K resolution with a GTX 1080 Ti? Let's find out. Welcome back guys to part two of the ultimate showdown between the i7-7700K which is clocked to 5 gigahertz and then we have the R7-1700 clocked to 4 gigahertz and then on the right there we've got the dual Xeons in at 3 gigahertz on the Sandy Bridge architecture there. Now I have also posted on Twitter the uh, dual Xeons with hyper threading disabled and all those games where the threads weren't being utilized are still utilizing 16 threads. So what this essentially means is that those games in the previous benchmark video and in this benchmark video that aren't utilizing all those 32 threads are indeed capped at 16 threads utilization. So this first benchmark here, Doom, it looks like the dual Xeons are actually winning this benchmark. Surprisingly, it was really interesting to see that they were pulling ahead here even though the, there is a bit of variance in this, but I did test the exact same uh, scene doing the exact same things. Uh, and one interesting thing that came out of this was the uh, R7-1700 at 4K in Doom on Vulcan did have input lag that was quite noticeable. And this is something that I didn't see at 720p, so that was a really interesting observation. Though with this first benchmark, it looks like the dual Xeons did score one of the only victories it did score in this game in comparison. So the next benchmark we have up here is Ashes of the Singularity and DX12. Now some interesting observations came out of here. First is the GPU utilization versus the power target limit or the power usage. We can see that it's jumping all over the place, sometimes even dipping as high or going as high as 120 something percent. You'll see that throughout this benchmark. Though the Ryzen CPU did score a clear victory in this benchmark over the 7700K, even though it was just by a little bit, it is still a victory and I do like to report on all the numbers throughout all these benchmarks. And of course the dual Xeons, interestingly enough, this is the only benchmark where having those 16 threads with hyper-threading enabled, it did score a victory over itself. And I did go back and retest this, and the 16 cores, 16 threads actually lost. In all the other benchmarks, it did win, but in this one in particular, it did lose. So the way that this benchmark is utilizing the CPU is still very interesting. But we can see here that the Ryzen CPU and the 7700K, even at 4K, are still being utilized near 100%. And that's because I put it on CPU focused mode. But the GPU utilization is absolutely crazy in this game. And I think the Ryzen CPU does do a better job of utilizing that GTX 1080 Ti in this benchmark. And now I have sped this up to 200% because I want to move on to the next benchmark as this one is very fast or it's actually very long and so I fastened it up to give you guys the results and we can see there the 1700 did score that pretty sweet victory which was good to see but moving on into the next game here I pushed this one up to the front of the queue because it's actually one of the surprisingly really optimized titles for the PC I was actually really shocked to see how well this title is optimized on PC, especially in DX11. You can see there, the dual Xeons, that's real. All those threads are being utilized. And we saw in that 720p benchmark, it actually scored close to the uh, Ryzen R7-1700. And then, of course, in this benchmark, we'll see that the 1700 and the 7700K score exactly the same frame rate. I was shocked. So in this benchmark, exactly the same frame rates across the 7700K and the R7-1700. Now one interesting thing at the end of this benchmark is the CPU utilization is 22% on the Ryzen and it's 33% I believe on the 7700K. So if that's any indication of how much extra headroom the uh, Ryzen CPU has then maybe an extra 50% but to keep in mind though Windows utilization of those CPU threads is still something to be seen but it is interesting when we do these benchmarks we get to see extra insights to how they really work and how things, uh, well, I guess the 4K benchmarks really were an eye opener. I thought it would just be boring and everything would be just the, exactly the same across the board, but that looks not to be the case. We can also see with that GPU there, the power consumption is going pretty damn high sometimes, uh, going over that cap of the Founders Edition there of 125%. So the Aorus 1080 Ti is doing a really good job 
with the overclocks that I've put on it. But the next benchmark we're moving on to is Metro Last Light. Now, this is another interesting benchmark in that it does utilize all the threads on the dual Xeons, but it really utilizes them in a low state. I've heard that it can utilize up to 64 threads, I believe, when things are loading, but in the game it can utilize only 32 threads max. Uh, but this is where the dual Xeons did score a quite a big loss compared to the other two, not just at 4K, but also at 720p. It really fell behind there, and the R7-1700 and the 7700K did pull out ahead, which was really good to see that they were performing almost neck and neck in this benchmark, because I know a lot of people are going to be playing at 4K and higher resolutions, and they want to know how the R7-1700 performs for that, because maybe they've got a productivity workstation which does generally like to have those higher resolutions, especially if you're doing uh, Premiere Pro workspace, you want that higher resolution in general so you can do more work in general. And then when you obviously want to go and play games after you've finished your work, you want something that'll be up to par, I guess. And so this is where the higher resolutions really start to make sense for the R7-1700. It does start to score pretty good results and pretty much identical to the uh, i7 7700k but of course having that extra productivity workroom and the extra threads and the extra power does help it out a lot in terms of smoothness though you guys can see the smoothness for yourself you guys can see that if you pause it because it's at 60 fps i've uploaded this video at 60 fps if you pause it at any time during the benchmarks you may be able to see some screen tearing or whatnot so if you guys are wondering about stuttering or 0.1 percent or 1 percent lows you can just, guys, you can just use your own eyes at any point in this benchmark, watch it at 60 FPS playback, and see if you notice any stuttering on any of these three rigs, because I like to tune my PCs really well. I like to have them lightweight, running as little clutter as possible, and that shows when you've got no stuttering and you've got a really good experience on all three PCs. And what we see here is on all three PCs, the game is running just amazing. It's running really well. This is on the max settings on DX11 here on Metro Last Light and any other game in this benchmark for that matter you can just see that the results are smooth as butter on all three PCs though of course the R7-1700 and the 7700K do come ahead of the dual Xeons and that's probably because you know of course we've got a five-year-old architecture there and of course we only have three gigahertz of clock speeds but one thing to note was that the CPUs as we go from a 720p up to 4k I do notice that the RAM usage does start to go up a little bit. I think that's because, um, and I made this mistake by accident with the AMD uh, Ryzen rig, I accidentally selected RAM instead of uh, VRAM for, to show the usage, and you probably see that's the only one where the RAM's showing up, but I'm glad I did this in hindsight because we got to see an extra insight into the benchmarks and how things scale from low to ultra settings with things like shadows and now this is rise of the tomb raider and interesting even though it lost at 720p the ryzen r7 1700 wins this benchmark and i went back and double checked this but it does indeed score a victory in the tomb raider benchmark i was really surprised i was like what the hell what's going on here but double checked it and yeah sure it loses at 720p but it wins at 4k Though still, it is a victory, and it is a victory for the Ryzen CPU, as you'll see when the results come up a little bit later. But I wanted to talk also about people saying, oh man, you should scrap Rise of the Tomb Raider. It's unoptimized, or it's giving bad results for an AMD CPU with an NVIDIA GPU. And I don't think that's, or I don't think any benchmarker should be scrapping games out of their benchmark uh, suite because of one game suddenly running bad on that. Because if you know this is the case this has been the case for a long time with games some games run better on different hardware than others it's always been the case since pc gaming started out now if that game is enjoyable and people go out and buy that game and they want to play that game why should we be scrapping them from the benchmarks uh, i mean starcraft 2 for example it's still a very popular title especially in the competitive scene and it's only it, of course it only utilizes two threads uh, but people still want to see those numbers just because they don't align with an 8-core 16-thread CPU. I don't think we should be scrapping them. I mean, I actually don't even bench StarCraft 2 to begin with, but people have been telling me that it's a crap game. It's Games like that should be scrapped from benchmarks, and games like Tomb Raider should be scrapped from the benchmarks. But Tomb Raider is an absolutely fine game, and as you saw before, it scored a victory for the Ryzen R7-1700. So I guess it's acceptable now because it wins at higher resolutions. I don't know. 
But as terms of telling people to scrap games from their benchmarks, guys, I don't think that's a that's a cool thing to do. I mean, I don't think any benchmark should be scrapping any game because it just runs crap on one piece of hardware. But of course, if it is like an NVIDIA title and that benchmarker is only testing NVIDIA titles, then of course you might want to start questioning, hey, throw in some AMD games or AMD optimized titles in there too to balance things out. But I don't think uh, any reviewer should be, or any reviewer that I know, should be scrapping games just because they don't favor one piece of hardware explicitly. Or at least any reviewer that I know who uh, is reputable out there will not be doing this for you guys. As we like to give you guys an angle on all different games and how they play. Because at the end of the day, if someone's going out there and buying hardware for a specific game, they will want to know how it performs. And if people are scrapping games that people like to play out of the benchmarks, then I guess how is anyone going to know how their favorite title plays with different hardware? So that is a very interesting insight and it is something that I like to incorporate regardless. As we look at some people for example, they just go out and buy hardware for one specific game and I know a lot of people out there, especially the multiplayer, the competitive multiplayer titles, want to just buy PCs for CSGO or League of Legends or Dota 2 or some of the things like World of Warcraft. So multiplayer benchmarks is something that I do want to incorporate a lot more into the channel. However, it is something that is very difficult due to the fact that it has a lot of variants involved. And that's something that multiplayer titles are always going to have. But we can see here with the results, the F1 2016 scores, the Intel did score a victory in this benchmark over the R7 1700. And then of course the Jules Zeons came in dead last, the poor Jules Zeons. Though the last benchmark I've got up here is Ghost Recon Wildlands, and this is a game that is again max 16 threads supported, at least while benchmarking this game. We see here the Jules Zeons, the poor Jules Zeons again, they come in dead last. Though when I did drop this title down to 16 cores, 16 threads, it did post a higher score for those Zeons. The R7-1700 does come in a little bit behind the 7700K in this title, though it's really not much to fret at. Though closing up the benchmarks, we can see that the i7-7700K and the R7-1700 with their max run-of-the-mill overclocks on air or water, they are scoring pretty similar scores with one CPU edging out the other at 4K and vice versa. And so it is a pretty even battle at 4K. So if you guys are looking to get a good CPU for productivity and higher res gaming, then of course the R7 1700 is a really good choice. I can't really fault it in any way, shape or form, but let's move over to a conclusion. So there it is guys, as you expected the results, there was really nothing in it as you go up in resolutions. And this is pretty much because we are now becoming GPU bound, but somewhere in between 720p and 4K, the results will pretty much scale in a linear fashion in that it will become more GPU bound and less CPU bound as you go up in resolutions and vice versa. Anyway guys, make sure you stay tuned for part three where I'm going to be doing some productivity tests and also things like multiplayer benchmarks and also some streaming benchmarks. So there'll be some great insight there that'll be coming out of part three. So I can't wait to bring that to you. And if you haven't already, be sure to hit that like button and subscribe and I'll catch you guys in another tech video very soon. Peace out for now. Bye.